like to thank everyone for taking the time out for, on this weekend to come to this event. We really do appreciate your attendance. So I have been given the honor to introduce people. Our branch secretary, Ms. S. Hartenberg. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Then we also have Ati Kema, who's the Judasa Chairman. For, and then we have a very special guest, Mr. M. Chalalala, who's a clinical psychologist, who's going to be doing a presentation on breaking bad news and self-care. Thank you. Okay. So now that I've done the welcoming and opening, I will be handing over to Dr. Ati Kema. He's going to be doing an uh, introduction or presentation on in introduction to the summer of in Judasa. Okay, so good morning everyone once again. So I am Ati Kema. I am a medical uh, officer working at uh, Robert Mendoza Superfoy Hospital. I'm also the acting Judasa uh, chair. I've been chair for now. This is my third year. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah, so due to COVID, unfortunately, uh, my previous committee members have actually launched out their wings and moved to other provinces. But yeah, so we've been doing Judasa now for the past three years in the Northern Cape. Um, but there was a previous committee that preceded my committee. Um, so I just wanted to just guys give you a quick breakdown about um, summer within the Northern Cape. So as everyone may know, uh, everyone knows, the Northern Cape is the smallest province with regards to the number of doctors that are working there. And the other thing that puts our province at a disadvantage is the distance. So the doctors are very scattered within the country, I mean the country, the province, which makes it extremely difficult for um, us as doctors to unite within the Northern Cape. And due to those factors, you guys have probably seen or, or heard a lot of stories about what has happened basically in the peripheries in regards to the working conditions of the doctors that are working there. What type of service that patients actually experience. Um, so basically, we as uh, Judasa and Slash Sama, we have to be those advocates for doctors and for our patients so that they can basically have access to better health care and also to get that um, service that they have the right to get. But then also, on the flip side, we as health professionals also need to be protected working environments and we should also play a big role with regards to developing our communities. Um, so I'm sure everybody knows what SAMA is, um, but for those who don't know, so basically SAMA is a registered non-profit um, Section 21 company. Um, it's basically an independent and voluntary professional association for medical doctors. So SAMA is so the SAMA is the only medical association in South Africa. Um, they're the only um, non-profit company that actually advocates for healthcare workers <coughs> within the, the whole of the um, Southern Africa, basically. Um, so the association basically represents uh, doctors in all matters that concern them with authority, um, credibility in the healthcare and environment. And then they, we also are part of uh, a, we are we're an active member in the World Medical Association. Um, the other thing that I would just want to reiterate, the mention here of authority and credibility, um, the, the, the chairperson, um, Dr. Hussein, I mean not Dr. Kutsia, sorry, and also Dr. Hussein, they actually are committee members of the HPCSA committee that actually evaluate um, the facilities to see if they're actually accredited for interns to, to work there. So that basically is one of the many, many roles that some plays within the lives of medical practitioners. Um, 
Um, so basically, I'm sure you guys want to ask yourselves what does summer offer? Because I'm sure you guys have heard a lot of things about other issues that we not going to mention here in the in this orientation. Um, but I'm sure you guys also are asking yourselves, but why um, do I need this association? So most of you guys have come fresh out of university. Um, you don't know what the working environment is, number one. Number two, you don't know what are your rights. I'm sure when you've attended all of your lectures, you can tell me how many bones you have in your middle ear, or what is your largest organ, or how to resuscitate the patient. But when you have to think about your internal relations at work and what rights you have, you, I'm sure you won't be able to, you won't, you won't know <coughs> as much as you would like to know. There's actually a lot of things that you need to be aware of when you are working in a working environment because we are not spared from those politics or those issues. But basically what summer holds or summer offers, so we are a stake, we basically have stakeholder representation because of the history that we've had with regards to fighting for the rights and improving the working circumstances for health professionals or practitioners. So we've worked with the CM, the CMSA, HPCSA, the Presidency, Health Ministry, WMA, World Health Organization, and other medical associations and interest groups across the globe. So not only within South Africa we, we have influence, but also internationally we also have quite a lot of influence. Um, we Summer also offers basically journals, CPD activities and point accreditation, which is actually something that is vital within the Northern Cape. Because if you actually have a look with regards to uh, point accreditation and CPD activities, there's very few that actually happen outside of Summer. Summer um, basically holds the majority of CPD events, which people tend to take for granted. Um, some also provides medical legal assistance. So from the perspective of a junior doctor, the most common issues from a medical legal perspective is things like um, salary issues, contractual issues, placement issues, even accommodation issues. So those are just one of the few things that, that sound very, that basically hit home with, with the individuals that are here at this meeting but these are not the only services that are provided here as you move up through your your career ladder there's other services or other assistances that assistance that some can provide um, they also have society representation so basically um, whether you're a specialist whether you're working in private whether you're working um, public or whether you're a general practitioner, some also covers you as a medical practitioner. Even um, doctors that are working overseas can become summer members. Um, and even if you are retired, you can still become a summer member. Um, <clears throat> so they also play a role in health policy um, committee, which helps position the association on policy matters affecting the profession. So they have basically as I've mentioned, since they work with the HPCSA or have some representations or representatives, they assist with the new, not laws or but policies that are set by the HPCSA or recommendations. The big example is the one with regards to overtime. Um, that that um, has been pushed basically by SAMA to try and get the HPCSA to try and um, recommend that overtime shouldn't be more than 80 hours for health of practitioners. Those are one of the few things that, um, or many things, sorry, that SAMA has done for us as doctors or medical practitioners. So they also um, provide advocacy, not just for members, but for the profession as a well. whole. Um, they also assist with member benefits, so they negotiate with regards to member benefits. If you rather look at the, the information
information leaflets that you can buy that you see some of the benefits that you can actually get from someone. Um, and then the something that actually, oh, they also assist with treatment codes. And then something that is not mentioned or that one doesn't hear much about summer is that summer actually has bursaries and scholarships actually available for individuals to study um, courses that they provide. And this is something that is it, it's not spoken of. Okay, so then the benefits which are most valuable to us as junior doctors. So as I've mentioned, labor relations is very important. So you it's your first time in this working environment. You don't know how um, how your working environment is. You don't know what is what you should tolerate, what you shouldn't tolerate, and it's very easy for you as as a doctor to become or medical practitioner to become a, not abused but misused within your working environment. So Sama basically or Judasa will assist with regards to resolving any grievances in the workplace. Um, it will help with dispute, referral and uh, representation on unfair labor practices. <coughs> um, they will assist in preparing for disciplinary hearings and unfair dismissals. Um, they will advise on rights pertaining to conditions of employment. Um, the other thing is in with regards to, to something that no one actually thinks about is basically journals and training opportunities. As I've mentioned that we have access to the SMJ. Um, we also have access to free or discounted training opportunities. And then the other thing is in scholarships and in bursaries that also are available. Okay, and then more about Judasa. Okay, so as you, everyone knows, basically, who, is, who falls part of Judasa? So it's from fourth year medical students all the way to first year, uh, I mean, doctors who are first year post concert. So we all automatically become Judasa members. So this is my last year this year, next year, part <laughs> of Judasa. Um, and then basically the Judasa leadership con contains of a, an executive committee and then they are supported then by the provincial, rep provincial representatives in each of the nine provinces. Depending on which province you are in, you will then decide, decide for them what your main objectives and goals are because each province is unique. Um, but we all answer to the executive committee. Then the other thing is that um, there's, we also provide in, institutional representatives. Um, oh, sorry, institutional representatives are, are, rec are recruited from provincial representatives. <coughs> so, <coughs> in layman's terms, it's almost like a shop steward basically. It's people that are working on the ground level, getting, they normally get the information or evaluate everything on the ground level. If there's any issues, then it goes up to the provincial committee. Then from the provincial committee, they either go by your branch or by your executive committee, depending on what the your issue or grievance is. Then the other thing is that elections are done uh, in the first quarter of each year. But due to COVID, we were unable to have uh, elections, but we should be having elections soon, hopefully June, July. So we have a function committee soon. And then, <clears throat> um, as you know, Judata, Judasa basically pursues matters which impact on the working conditions of junior doctors of various stakeholders. And then, Judasa is then also a special interest group um, of SAMA, um, together with Sedasa. Edasa and Sama. Okay. So, the question is how does one become involved in the summer structures and activities? So, to become a summer member, as I've explained, you just have to be part of the HPCSA and then you sign up and then you will just pay the monthly membership fees. As an intern, if I'm not mistaken, you pay 204 rand, 202 rand a month. Or you can pay annually if you like that as well as the annual amount. And then with then the higher up you move then the, the membership is increased, but they don't go past four hundred and and for the things that you get, it's it's definitely a problem. 
But one thing that I would like to mention is that when you look at your salary slip, is uh, you get a deduction of 104 and if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And that basically goes to the bargaining, the bargaining council. council. And that bargaining mm -hmm. council is basically part of, it's made out of, made of lots of trade unions. Mm -hmm. um, examples is our spare side our spare and our yeah. PSA. Um, PSA. There's basically more than, I think more than 80, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Yeah. And they function or that, that their duty is to go to the bargaining council to, to basically discuss things with regards to salary issues. Not salary issues, but like your salary increase. Mm -hmm. And then other things like your working hours, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. So that if you see on your salary slip, even though you are a summer member, you're mm -hmm. still going to have that deduction. Yeah. Because, yeah. yeah, I think it's on your pay slip as... Uh, you'll see it's a PSHBCC, -S -S something like that, yeah. but it's quite long. I think it's something, yeah, but yeah. it's something long, long, but it's about 100 and something rand, 104. <coughs> yeah, so just know that that is for the bargaining council, actually. Yeah, so it's, it's not that you bought yeah. the, the trade union. Yeah, so basically, um, if, you, if you wish not to belong to any trade union like Nehao, Sama, or you know, you 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 will you automatically, you know, in that bargaining council. So um, you do have a choice of not if you don't want to. Um, you get that free choice when you go to when you go initially for when you start working and you get your HR will tell you 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 can join a union if you wish and if you do not wish to. You're not forced to join any union um, as a government employee. You can, you you don't need to join any union because automatically pay increases and stuff. You automatically will get it, just like everyone else. Even if you're just paying that one or four, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I'm just putting it being fair mm -hmm. and you know. Uh, <coughs> Okay, then the other thing is that we've got for I think, is, do we only have two in India? we have more than 20 branches? We have about 22 branches yeah. in South Africa. Yeah. yeah. I think. So we have more than 20 branches, but we have 22 branches um, throughout the country. Yeah. The country. And as uh, Natava has mentioned, we, the GWB. Yes, Tripol and West branch. Yes. Yeah. It's still, uh, Tripol and West branch, sorry Dr. Kima, it's still like, it's coming, the name comes on from those years. But I think they are looking um, into uh, lots of things like demarcation of areas and stuff to sort that out from some air office. And then they're also going to look at uh, re, uh, say, you know, naming the branch something else and so on. Yeah. But yeah, so but basically each branch then, yeah, uh, so. they arrange their own activities, own meetings, and events. Apart from the main, the national events that have yeah. also been held, um, so to become involved, basically, you can definitely have a chat with Sultana. She basically knows everything about summer and how to become a member. She yeah, really knows yeah. every single thing. Not really. Like but if you, if you <laughs> test her, she will pass. No, I won't. She's summer. <laughs> she is summer. Yeah. Um, but also, uh, yeah, so, and then. But if you also would like to know what other positions or roles you can also play, you can definitely also have a chat with me or with Sultana again. Um, because there is uh, a lot that you can do or a lot of change that you can bring, basically. And then you can also be part of the special interest group, as you guys may know, know that you guys are part of Judasa. So there's also an opportunity of actually serving on the provincial representative committee. Um, I think that's about it that I can think of. Um, uh, I just put up the benefits, but you have a page where you guys can look at what benefits are available. There's some cool things that are there. Yeah. Uh, like especially those ones that are going to buy themselves from the CDs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you, get a, you get a discount, yeah. quite a decent discount. Mm. Um, and then there's other parts that you, but I'm sure if no one is interested, it's just a uh, the yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, so you can just visit the website or social platforms if you want to get any more information. The summer website is actually it's actually a really good website. They actually post a lot of the announcements. They have the podcasts that are even posted on the um, YouTube videos, any other interviews. So if you want to keep up
up with basically what's happening with regards to medical issues, with regards to medical practitioners, or just general information, um, you can always find it on Sama, Sama's website. Because even with this whole COVID-19 um, pandemic, they Sama was assisted with regards to uh, the dispersing or of, the, of the vaccines itself. Yes. So they are working in partnership with the Sisonke program, and then they are the ones that advise which hospitals mm -hmm. should um, provide vaccinations. So that is something important that we should realize as as junior doctors that our work is not only within the wards that we should try and make change outside of the wards because as you can see there's a lot that is happening on the outside and if we do not advocate for s such things then our working environment then becomes worse and then the patients are the ones that end up being mm -hmm. So basically that is the end of my very long presentation. My first name is Deepika. Most people I know. Um, but it's Marseille. It's a Kaiser name. Um, my surname is not Kaiser. It's a mixture of Tonga and some things that I don't know. <laughs> and honor to stand here in a small group, um, but I think it's acceptable, it's fair, given that we're dealing with a lot, including the pandemic, some people who don't wake up in the morning, so I think it's okay. Um, I can always, in future, come back if it's needed to a larger group. I agree. Um, if the group is happy and they feel like, well, you need, we need this more. But anyway, I'm going to speak about communicating bad news. I don't want to call it breaking bad news because it has to do a lot with establishing rapport first and communicating for our patient. I liked what you said when you spoke about the working environment. It's like being thrown in the lion's den, not sure what to expect then, that fear of the animal. So, for those who are working at RMSH, as I, we would agree that we deal with a lot of chronic illnesses. Um, some patients are even on that end of life stage and you are tasked most of the time to break news to them um, about either their prognosis or the management plan. Management plan. So, I want to start off by perhaps asking if anybody has an experience of communicating, breaking bad news to a patient. All of us. Okay, all of you. All right, how was the feeling at first? Initially, Initially it, it is a bit overwhelming and scary um, for yourself before it is for the patient because you feel like you're going to communicate something that's bad to another person, you're going to change their life and you're not really completely and 100% sure because you're not God, so is the information that you're communicating accurate? Um, are you really preparing them? Are you prepared enough to tell them this kind of information? Are you yes. qualified enough to tell them this kind of information? That's quite true. Mm, that's quite true. And also sometimes uh, it's that thing of theoretical and the practical side is different. You can read of breaking bad news, but when you are there with the patient in front of you, now you have especially uh, the unexpected uh, diagnosis, so whereby they came there for headache and then you have to report that they have a tumor. Yes. So it's a, it's a different uh, setup. I'm making just an example. But my experience on breaking the bad news has been sometimes uh, uh, it's one of those that it's easier if the patient knows what they're expecting, but when they don't know totally, yeah, it's quite yeah, heartbreaking even for yourself. Yes. You need to be emotionally also prepared to. 
that's true because the reality is we are dealing with quite a diverse population um, in the Northern Cape as well. I think we have a lot of um, people, different cultures, different beliefs. So it's, it's, it's never easy to break bad news to a patient. Um, so if you have to think about how authors define breaking or communicating bad news is any information which will adversely and seriously affect the individual's view of his or her future. Um, for some hospital or uh, for some organization, it's like a routine, but it's still a difficult task even for psychologists or even for medical practitioners because it's, it's not an easy thing. It involves a lot of emotions, like we have said, it's very overwhelming. And it remains an aspect of um, clinical training that is very overlooked. Um, I think they said medical school, but I think also within psychology as a profession, we don't emphasize this a lot in our intents or our concepts. We just throw them there to deal with these things. So evidence indicates that most patients want to be informed about their illnesses, treatment and prognosis, whether the information is good or bad. Sometimes it's just no time to do that. You don't have the resources. It remains a difficult task. So a number of models exist. Um, you might have read about them on journals, on Google, in books. But I think one of the most common is the spikes is a six-step strategy. We have the ABCDE model, um, the breads that are utilized there, because I think it's the one that we mostly utilize and the highest model. So all these models are common, they are similar in that they, they guide you accordingly on what to look for or how to prepare yourself when you want to break bad news to a patient. When but it's not a clear cut given that our population differs with where these models originated from. Could be Western things, now we are dealing with a cultural sensitive individual, a 70 year old who's telling you you are not going to put that on my hand, you are not going to inject me. You are saying, well, if you don't do this, then you won't live to see the next day. And he tells you, well, I still need to go and consult with my ancestors and hear what they say about this. And you are standing there thinking, if I don't do this, then this patient is going to die and the family is going to come and sue the hospital. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's quite a sensitive thing. And like I've said, um, these are the things that we don't speak about in the hospital setup. Anyway, so like I've said, your school of thought will have to do a lot with um, how you approach the breaking bad news. Um, within psychology as a profession, we mostly focus on the person-centered, which is more about the unconditional positive regard of the patient. With a patient like that telling you, I believe in this, not that, you need to regard the patient as they are. And perhaps also allow them time to integrate what we have said with what they believe. And I can assure you, in my experience working with patients, I've found out that there's just no time to wait for the patient to come back. And they might not even come back at all. Once you discharge them, you are not going to see them again. The next time you see them, is another thing. It's like a revolving door kind of a patient. And the most important thing in this instance is where you are going to consult this patient when you communicate bad news. I want to make an example with our hospital because I think it's in that state where in privacy and confidentiality is not easily awarded to our patients. The curtains are worn out. There's just no space, the walls are full, and you need to stand there and communicate sad or bad news to a patient. We 
thing that we are meant to as uncomfortable as you are. What do you do then? Or oh, this patient is not mobile enough, there is no wheelchair, it's just lying there on bed in front of other patients. Um, you are tasked with informing them about the cancer, which perhaps has metastasized to other parts of the body. How do you handle the issue? Come back to that. So learning to use the environment to communicate is very experiential and will improve with time. Like I've said, there are spaces or environments that are user-friendly, but go to our teams, it doesn't happen. We are given a very untidy room. Now, this is the only one we have for you, doctor. Either this or nothing you need to settle for that. And that's what we, we have experienced as well. So let's use the BREX protocol for communicating bad news. I've found out that most of the time we task a person who does not know the background of the patient. Somebody saw the patient last night, um, they knocked off, then this person comes in the morning, so and so is waiting for you on the bedside. Mm -hmm. Here are the clinical notes. Perhaps they are not even clear or they are shortened. Not enough information. What do you feel then? It's not going to happen. You aren't going to communicate effectively if you don't know the background of the patient, if you have not assessed the patient, if you also don't know the support system. The next of kin of the patient, who do you call after communicating the news or before communicating the news? And the other important thing is establishing rapport with the patient. Perhaps you have a list of patients that you need to see for that day, and then you just want to go in and out. It's not going to work on your favor. You need to at least have time to hear the patient's concerns before you come with your parents. So establishing rapport is also important. And also explore, like I've said, we're dealing with a cultural sensitive population. Explore what the patient wants to do, or what they've done before. What do they understand? Who did they speak to? Is there any form of support? That's why we approach this um, breaking bad news within an MDT setup where you will have a lot of other professionals, be it social workers or even OTs that are working with the patients as well. And when you have to announce the bad news, don't disguise it with medical journals. But the patient is not going to understand what you say. Especially those that are functioning on a low level intellectually, Perhaps due to stimulation in the environment, they didn't go to school, they don't understand what you're talking about. Try to use simple language with the patient so that they, they do understand. And also, kind of, um, this is more like, how do I put it? When you have to, to kind of, it's like you, you are rejuvenating that relationship you have had with the patient. I mean, you have treated this patient for a longer time now to know or to spot their strength. It's still a patient, but there are strengths within that patient. And you can also use that to integrate communicating the bad news. And of course, you will also have to allow the patient to summarize. You came with the news, allow them to give it back to you. What did they understand? And then you can make your own summary in terms of are we giving you palliative care? Are we discharging you? What's going to happen? Then the rest will take its course. But like I've said, this is not an easy process. Am I going too fast? Is it still okay? It's hard. 
Okay. So as we continue, it comes back to what we have said. That feeling of being overwhelmed. So before you break bad news, you need to mentalize. You need to check in. Mentalizing um, simply means reflecting and interpreting your own reactions with regards to the patient's beliefs, thoughts, and emotions. You zoom in into what I'm feeling can easily be projected into the patient. That anxiety, the patient can sense it that, okay, this person is very anxious, or this person is just all over the show. And once they pick up that energy, they are going to receive that news holistically. There are parts that they will miss. So I think it's very much important also to not use medical jargons, like I've said, and of course the defense mechanism that comes with breaking bad news. Defense mechanism is very two-way straight. It can be from me to the patient or the patient to me. And because these unwanted emotions are very uncomfortable, they will want to block. And once they block, there is no way through. You are just going to eat a block. That's why you just keep coming back. But I've told you, it's written in the note that we have explained, we have communicated the bad news, and the patient doesn't get it. And that's what we we'll use as a poor insight, or poor judgment, those kind of words. It's because there is a lot of defense mechanism there. Denial being one of them. This patient has not accepted their diagnosis as yet. They need time, but we don't have time. We need to give you treatment as soon as we can. Um, the counter effect as well, um, it has happened that um, you have heard of how difficult a patient is. This is a difficult patient, they don't cooperate. You come in with that energy. You say, oh, well, I'm dealing with a difficult patient. You come in, I've heard you are difficult, so I'm also going to show you how difficult I am. So there is transparent and counter-transparent. And I mean, it's, it's, it's fair, but at the same time, just be aware of how easily you can influence treatment of your own patients. Power dynamics, I'm a psychologist, you're a patient, you're going to listen to me, either my way or nothing. Um, what I've learned is it doesn't work with our population. They know a lot than we do. They Google, they read. Already when they come, they diagnose themselves with a lot of things. So if you have to challenge them, you should have you should know your story quite well. And that's what I've picked up recently with our patients. They come in with all those symptoms from the book. They've diagnosed themselves. Um, they just want confirmation or a second opinion. And if you give them that, then you are feeding onto that illness, anxiety kind of a thing. Um, and I think also using a lot of humor can be very problematic. I want to give you an example with a patient that came in because she attempted suicide. Um, I don't know from which unit or discipline this person said to her, sure, yeah, what you did was quite a stupid thing, eh? Okay. And they laughed about it. So yeah, it was a stupid at the same time, it's suicide, a form of stupidity. Okay. I think it's one of those mental, underlying mental issues. So it can be humor to say, well, you are trying to establish something with the patient, but it can easily go the wrong way. If the patient is going to say, okay, you said what I did was stupid. It means you don't take me serious, those kind of things. So I think also avoid using a lot of humor. There is nothing wrong with using humor, but don't overdo it. All right. Can you see this slide? Uh, I apologize for that. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to. Okay. So who does the breaking of the bad news? It could be the attending doctor, the specialist. Um, somebody who knows the patient or who the patient is comfortable with. 
But this accountability, I always find it very problematic with personality patients mm -hmm. because they split. Uh, either you are good or you are bad. I want to see Dr. Kema only. Mm -hmm. He's not at work, he's coming back next week. Mm -hmm. Then what? No, I'll wait, I'll wait for him to come back. <laughs> but there is somebody who's willing to sit with you and take you through the process. You know? And also be aware of those patients. Mm -hmm. They can easily split between professionals as well. That's why you will be the patient survives or you have patients that survive. Um, like I've said, multidisciplinary team, social worker, psychologist, nurses, everybody. Um, sometimes we work in relatives or family members where it's deemed necessary. Um, but I always find it very challenging um, when the support system is unhealthy or if the patient tells you I don't have a good relationship with my family I want to break that confidentiality that trust um, with the patient and bring people that are also influencing possibly this illness in a way um, and also our nursing staff they are very much important because they are in the world throughout um, the treatment process. So bad news can include um, disease recurrence, spread of the disease, failure of the treatment, um, presence of irreversible, irreversible side effects, results of genetic tests, um, issues regarding palliative care, and so forth. I've picked up a trend in RMSH where in psychology will be brought in to be kind of a middleman between professionals and patients because we are dealing with patients with personality issues then they fight with treating doctors or even nurses, OTs and then they are called in to come and somewhat cycle the ground. Well, and the grass will suffer most because um, as we come in there, it's not easy to 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 work with subjectives. You want to be as objective as possible. But then, these two people are not working well together. What am I going to do now as a professional? And these this dynamics, um, I think, they, they arise from failure of giving ourselves time to take as much as clinical information as possible and to also understand where the patient is functioning at. So, you have communicated bad news to the patient. These patients start breaking down. Is that a normal or an abnormal reaction? Very, it's a very normal reaction. But because sometimes we get anxious, the patient has started let me bring in a counselor, let me bring in somebody to calm the patient down. You come in there, the patient is still very hysterical. You say, okay, well, I think the patient is depressed. That was quick. The patient is hysterical, yes. You just told them, well, your cancer had spread, you have six months to live. It's very normal for me to cry and become emotional, but it's not linked to. So I think we also need to make that distinction and allow ourselves, um, our patients time to integrate the news, cry as much as possible, as much as they want. At a later stage, if you still feel the patient need further support, then you can refer accordingly. Because once you get anxious and you want to diffuse this whole situation, 
So it means those emotions are going to just build up and the patient will just blow up. And it's also important to compare the patient's mental state before and after you've communicated the bad news in order to determine a significant connection. And in this case, there will be tears, there will be sad moments, anger, um, there will be denial. <coughs> Acceptance is not going to come soon, as we expect it. It's still a process. And within this whole communicating bad news, we cannot underlook this important ethical um, consideration. In our note keeping, when we have communicated bad news, we need to ensure we have the patient's name, we have the patient's hospital file number, if um, possible, the date and time of the interview, or when the news was communicated, the location, it could be a ward, it could be in the psychology office, it does not matter, those who were present is very much important. Um, and those people need to also sign um, it can also include family members and the relationships, clinical diagnosis, um, the clinical options for future management or immediate care if it was discussed, detail of the word used when breaking bad news. This one is quite difficult because you could have spent the whole hour and 30 minutes communicating with the patient. You are not going to grasp everything but at least give us an idea of what you said to the patient in a form of a clinical note. And of course, let's all learn to sign and date our, our notes. Well, the patient's file have unsigned notes, guys. <laughs> or unclear in writings. <laughs> or somebody was in a rush, they just write, they just sign without initial, I don't know who you are, I don't know your name. I need now to figure out who was working when on this hour. It's too much logistics. And I think we are all culprits because I've, I've done it before. Because I rushed what I was doing. All right. Okay. Before I go to that slide, are we, are we still on? Uh, yes. We're still together? Okay. I just want to ask something. So this is all now. I'd say not a perfect setting, but like for me, I don't know, it just feels like we as doctors, we've already decided what is bad and the, uh, on a scale of bad. Let's mm -hmm. say for us now, we've seen 10 people coming in with strokes. Mm -hmm. uh, we died of strokes. Yes. Really, I, sometimes I feel like we have dehumanized things so much that we were like, yes, can I not just keep the stroke patient at the hospital because we want them to Yes. Yeah, and then, so that's where I started because and then no one even told her what the complications are of, of, of being a diabetic. So she just thought it's, I must think the call, I don't know why. So when I actually explained to her what can happen, she was, but no one told me this. And then like for me it was just like, it's diabetes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's yes. the problem that I have in that we've, we've normalized bad news. Like we were really said that. It's just a stroke. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's how we give him the information. Yeah. Like, yeah, no, but I mean, she, she won't be able to walk properly, but yes. yeah, the physio and OT will sort that out. Mm -hmm. That's that's how we are breaking news now. That we, so I, I want to know how do we get back to actually us as doctors realizing, okay, this is literally someone's family member that you be saying, okay, so we'll properly. But for us, it's just like send up to the ward, physio OT. And that's quite true, that's quite true. And I think it's possibly due to our limited stuff, limited warm bodies, you are expected to do five people's job, it's impossible. That's why you need to utilize your resources in a way that you will not easily burn out. Because it's easily leading to that. Because if you now have to deal with breaking bad news, putting this, doing that, sure, just too much. And I think it's, it's, it's good for us to go back to the basics. Okay, it's not mine. Mine also rings like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
going back to the basics in a form of, I think you can easily determine what you can do at that stage and what's not possible to do. Um, and a patient like that for me also comes across as somebody who's that in that pre-contemplation stage of change. They are aware they need to take treatment, but for on what level, they're still not sure. Well, I will take it when I feel like it. So a bit of defaulting in there. So once you tell them you are going to die tomorrow, you know, their world is going to shut off. And they're not going to integrate that until the last stage where they are, they are told, well, we need to amputate you now. There is nothing more that we can do other than that. Do you know? And we do come across patients like that. And it's not easy to work with them. It's not easy because they also don't allow you into their space yeah. in a form of um, supportive counseling or su supportive um, therapy. It's not easy. It's not easy. Those are difficult patients to work with. And I mean, there is no manual to go about it, but also for yourself, what is it as possible practical to do? I think also documenting everything um, puts you in a comfortable position to say, well, as much as this patient is not compliant, everything is documented. So it brings me to this important aspect of self-care. The self is the tool that we use to do our job. So if that tool is broken, it's not going to function how it's supposed to. And I know all of us are expected to perform miracles, to go over and above with limited resources, and you just tell yourself, if I don't do it, who else will? And you are running into a big trouble. I think Simon and I were in a chat earlier, and he taught me about his long weekend travel. It was fun and nice going up and down, visiting friends. His body allowed him to, but then as soon as he got back to work, <laughs> he felt extremely tired. Because it was all over the show. It was busy, it was fun. He felt like he's taking care of himself, but he wasn't. So I think the body will easily tell you to slow down. But in our professions, there is no time to slow down. Everybody wants to be seen, everybody wants to consult, people want opinions, our family want us, they want this, they want that. It's exhausting. So breaking bad news can be a very traumatic experience if led by an emotionally unstable healthcare professional. When I say emotionally unstable, I'm talking about somebody who has not done a self-check. Um, when we when we're doing our M1, they had this compulsory thing of you are not going to be a psychologist if you have not been in a session before. It was compulsory. You don't negotiate it. There would be one proof that you went to see somebody, and I think that helped because then you will learn things about yourself that you are not aware of. And sometimes they even grill you, they make you feel quite incompetent, but it helps because then it builds some emotional resilience when you have to deal with patients. But I think we're dealing with patients. So this is a lifelong investment. Ooh. When else did you take your annual leave? Last year? Yeah. We are in April now. <laughs> Which month last year? It was uh, unfortunately the beginning of December. The beginning of December. Okay, not too long, but in a real world, it suggested that one should take their annual leave at least once every three months. Mm -hmm. But we're not in the real world. I don't know which world we are in. I don't know which planet we are in. <laughs> But our planet, I last trip live in November last year. And five years live here, one have in nine years. So 
because I'm one of those people that think if I leave, then the department will fall apart. I'm not taking care of myself. I know. There are days where I don't feel like waking up to go to work, and that's a sign of being fatigued or bent out. I felt it, I felt it. But then what do I do? If I go, if I go and leave, then my patient will call, where is this person? For emergencies. And it's a sign of bad leadership. Because I fear that um, things will fall apart if I'm not at work. So we need to invest in ourselves. Self-care is very much important. Because if this tool breaks apart, then you are not going to render effective services to your patients. Please take your annual leaves. Don't reserve them. Say, so, okay, I want to reserve them for December. I want the whole 22 days. <laughs> I want to sit home for the whole month. It's not going to work. And you're not going to rest because that's the time where most families travel and they have um, gatherings and so forth. If you tell yourself I will only rest in December, mm. then I need to speak to your managers to force you to take it. Mm -hmm. It's important. It's, it's, it was given to you for a reason. Utilize it so that you recuperate and come back to save this nation. That's difficult to save. That's always ask a lot of us. You give them two apples, now they want the whole crate. That's the patience that we deal with. Um, participate in physical activity that is pleasurable for you. Ooh. Somebody spoke about hiking, and I was like, I've never hiked before. Maybe I should try it. Perhaps it would be nice for me. <laughs> the hospital used to have a football team. I don't know if it exists now. Even those that doesn't know how to play soccer, they will just come for the fun of it. It's part of taking care of yourself. Unfortunately, I can't swim. <laughs> but there are other things that I can do. Um, and also rest. much as your body needs. Uh, I know we do have routines. I would have a routine where in I sleep for a few hours, wake up, do some work and sleep a day. It works for me. I just, I just don't know for other people if it will work. But you can also find a routine that will be helpful for you. Huh. Laugh, cry, dance and sing. There is this thing, I don't know if it exists in other cultures, that men are not allowed to cry. There is this thing that exists in other cultures, men are not allowed to cry. Bold. <laughs> Pretend or show that strong face. Not in my world. If it's needed, if it's necessary, we do share some emotions and some tears. We do laugh, we do cry. Oh, I was dancing the long weekend. It was nice. Touch another being. I didn't want to phrase it how they phrased it, but I think interpersonal, intimate relationships are also very much Take care of our partners, take care of our wives, our husbands, our spouse, our fiancés, and also give, give ourselves time with them. Don't neglect partner. So, okay, because I'm working overtime, I have a lot to do. Try to balance the two of your work and your, your relationship. Because the self um, is, is quite a aspect in this human existence and like I've said if you break apart then everything else stops 
and I think that should be about it. Um, so thank you everyone for, for coming. We really appreciate your attendance today. Even though it was an intimate event, I think everyone has taken something from this particular uh, presentation by Mr. Chabalala and by Dr. Kema. Um, I want to end on the session with um, something that really stuck with me and it was repeated over and over and over and I think everyone can benefit from this whether you're a healthcare professional or you're not. Dr. Kema, how do you start a resuscitation of a patient? Call for more. No, besides that, <laughs> what, what's Has the... no. <laughs> Has it alone? Has it? Hello? Help. Yeah. H -H -H. So, I want to emphasize that you, with everything that you do and how we proceed from this particular event, we need to remember the hazard, hello, help. Hazard, everyone always thinks, do I have the right PPE? Do I have the right gloves? Do I have the right, is the setting okay? But what you need to think about is, am I okay to proceed? Mm. Am I okay to deliver the service to my patient? Am I okay to go to work? If not, call for help. <laughs> Otherwise, you will not be a benefit to anyone, including yourself. And I want us to take this message with us when we go home. Thank you so much for coming, and I hope to see you guys around socializing. And all. thank you so much.